Hello and welcome to episode 23 of series 2 of the Engaging Internal Comms podcast. This is the show for employee engagers and internal communicators who like to keep up to date with all that is new in our profession. My name's Craig Smith from The Big Picture People. Welcome to the podcast if this is the first time you've listened to it. If you do want to catch up on our, some of our previous episodes, you can catch up on them on your platform that you're listening to this podcast on now, or you can go to our website, which is engagingic.com, and there you will find on our uh, back catalogue all of our episodes that we've recorded over the last year. Now, just coming up in the next episode, which is episode 24 of this se- season, which is on the 31st of August, I have an interview with Lisa Gwinnell from Siemens. And Lisa is going to be telling us all about how internal communications has earned and needs to maintain its place at the table, i.e. that it's now a business partner for many organisations following the challenges of 2021 and 2020, but also going forward that uh, internal communications has really proved its worth. And Lisa is going to be telling us all about the work that she's been doing in her organisation and also professionally as well with the Institute of Internal Communications uh, to, to help that very thing. Um, And then following that on the episode after that, on the 14th of September, we have an interview with Niall Ryan from the Department of Health and Social Care. And Niall is going to be telling us all about how you can maintain organisational purpose with a remote workforce, which again is a topic that is something that everybody is kind of thinking about at the moment. How do we keep people connected when we have people working either remotely or hybridly and or maybe a mix of people working in an office or in a central location? and working remotely as well. So that's coming up on the 14th of September. Now, between um, now and then, uh, we also have one of our webinars coming up on the 9th of September, uh, 2021, that is. At three o'clock in the afternoon, we have a free webinar, which is designed for anyone who is involved or has colleagues who may be involved in driving a health and safety agenda within your organisation. So communicating important health and safety messages or looking to maybe reinvigorate your training around health and safety. Part of the work that we do is helping organisations with that um, through our own communication approach. So we're doing it, running a webinar on some of the ways that you can transform the way that you engage your people around this topic, which is traditionally quite a dry topic. So uh, I think you'll find that interesting. That's the 9th of September. And as I say, it's three o'clock in the afternoon. It's totally free. You can find out more about that at our website. So if you go to the bigpicturepeople.co.uk and on our menu at the top of the the screen you'll see events and the first event that is uh, listed there is that event it's called transforming health and safety communication and training you can find out some more information and you can book via the link on that page. So finally, before we go into today's uh, guest interview, uh, just to remind you that if you are enjoying the show and you find it useful and you think there are some colleagues or associates of yourself who might find the show useful, please let them know. Please send them a link. Uh, It always helps us to to boost our listenership and with an increased listenership, we can attract more and more guests uh, and and, uh, and get some great interviews from them to share with you and help you to to learn. So uh, if that's uh, if you know anyone who's interested and might be interested in the show, please share the link with them. Anyway, on to today's guest. During the pandemic of 2020 and 2021, many internal communicators have had to find ways of keeping in touch with very diverse audiences and audiences that have become even more diverse with people working from home. People continue to work from from their facilities where home working isn't possible. And this diversification has caused some real complexity. Um, and particularly in larger organisations where there is a, a, a significant proportion of people who are working in different types of environments and people who've had to shift to home working, this has become an increasingly challenging situation. So I wanted to speak to someone who was working in an organisation that was very diverse, very large, over 25,000 employees spread across many different countries to 
explore not only the pandemic related communications challenges that that brings, but also what are some of the things that that particularly related to the pandemic, uh, some of the challenges that's raised from a communications perspective, from an internal communications perspective. And I was also interested to look at how that will change as we maybe we move back to a more hybrid way of working in the future, um, but also some of the fundamentals about how we continue uh, and how we can better engage people who are not necessarily having access to the technology that we take for granted for our office-based staff, such as people who who aren't on emails, they don't have access to technology, that sort of thing. So how can we keep them engaged and informed? And I also wanted to just have a think about what are some of the skills that we need to be looking to develop as internal communicators as we come out of the pandemic and work, work into uh, move into a working world, which is where more hybrid and more uh, diverse ways of working are going to be more prevalent. So that's what today's interview is all about. So my interviewee today is Neil Jenkins. Neil is an award-winning internal communications director and leader with over 20 years of experience across FMCG, technology, manufacturing, and engineering. Neil's worked in organizations such as Siemens, Vodafone, Coca-Cola, BT, and more latterly, Iron Mountain. Neil is passionate about using the power of communications to get the best out of people, to connect them with their organizations, and to build a reputation and trust from the inside out. Hello. Hello, Neil. How are you? Hi, Craig. Nice to talk to you. Nice to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so just for the listeners, Neil, where, where, are you, where are you in the world at the moment? So I am based in the UK. Um, I live in South Bucks, uh, a few miles to the west of London, and uh, would normally be in the office um, a few times a week in central London. We, we are based not far from Tower Bridge. Okay. Yeah. And of course, we're recording this hopefully at the tail end of the pandemic so uh, so yeah so hence why you're probably spending a lot more time at home at the moment uh, uh, but uh, are you planning to be back into the office at some point we're going to talk about that in the interview from a kind of organizational perspective but is the, is the plan to kind of move to a more hybrid way of working yeah yes so I have missed it I have to say I no. have um, always been uh, home based in this role but always used to spend a couple of days at least in our office and it is going to be good to get back. I'm expecting to do that probably towards the tail end of the summer. Yeah. Um, and just the ability to kind of see people again, reconnect, yeah. um, talk face to face, um, understand a bit more about what's going on, how people have felt uh, during the last 18 months or so. I, I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. So any anyway, uh, Neil, I mentioned you're currently at, at Iron Mountain, and uh, I, 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 it was I, I, hands up, it was an organisation I, I wasn't familiar with before for uh, coming across you and, and obviously talking to you about the before, prior to the interview. But uh, I, it's an amazing story. I, I'd, 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 I'd love for the listeners' point of view if you can just tell us a little bit more about the business. Yes, yeah, so we are an information management company. Um, we are 70 years old, celebrating our 70th anniversary this year. Um, and we actually began life as Iron Mountain Atomic Storage, um, <laughs> which gives you a sense of the uh, the way the world was feeling at the time. Um, we were founded really at the, uh, at the height of the Cold War, when um, organizations were really getting quite worried about, you know, how to protect and, and store, you know, really precious things, uh, records, other artifacts that, that sort of matter to them. Mm. Um, and our founder, who was uh, a mushroom farmer, he'd invested in an old iron ore mountain just outside New York City and spotted an opportunity um, and essentially started um, storing, you know, records, other other precious things for our first customers um, back in, in, in the 1950s. Uh, we had our first sales office in the Empire State Building. Um, so Iron Mountain literally was an iron mountain. Um, mm. And we've grown since then. Um, you know, we are now present in about 55 countries. Uh, we have around 225,000 customers. We're, we're a $4 billion company in terms of revenue. Um, and we serve about 95% of the Fortune 1000. So, um, mm. so yeah, growth has, has sort of been pretty rapid over the last 70 years. Um, we yeah. now have about 25,000 employees. Yeah. Um, and in increasingly, you know, we don't just store things for people. We, we're digitizing their records. Yeah. We're yeah. using some nice and neat solutions to, 
really help them get more out of the information that, that we store for them. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether that's to improve their own operations or, or the experience of their own customers. So yeah. it's, it's a really, really interesting business. And we also have some really, really uh, neat and smart uh, divisions. We have an entertainment services uh, division, for example, which stores original music recordings. Yeah. Uh, we have a fine art division that, that stores precious paintings. Um, so there's some really, really interesting things that we do as a business. And, mm. and you know, some of the ways we store things and the ways that we serve our customers is actually really interesting. Fantastic. Well, re- yeah, yeah. And I, lo- I love I love, a story. I love an organization that can t- tell a really kind of coherent story, you know, and that links to its name and everything. And it's just, I think it's wonderful how you're, you're uh, you, you know, that kind of whole, and how that's obviously, you, you've kind of leveraged that into, into uh, you know, protecting information, data, precious things in all, all forms, not just in physical form. So fantastic. So, um so y- your role is is obviously as I said at the beginning is 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 internal comms and di- and, and you're di- you're the uh, internal comms director of internal comms at, at Iron Mountain. You've got twenty five thousand people. Just just let's just talk a little bit about some of the some of the challenges that that that, that, that brings. Obviously, fantastic. I'm sure it's a fantastic organisation to work in. But you you, you mentioned them when we spoke spoken originally about the fact that obviously. You, you know the the kind of Iron Mountain in the U.S. the kind of Empire Empire State Building with the uh, where the head office was. I guess it's easy to be sort of uh, see yourself sometimes, or, or or to have the challenge of being U.S. centric when you've got a global workforce. So, what are some of the challenges you face, and and what are some of the issues you face when in terms of having a a much more kind of um, diverse workforce now than maybe when the organization set out seventy years ago. Yeah, so so we are very diverse. I, I think in terms of the, uh, the the presence we have across the globe, uh, we are truly global. Um, but we still have a very large uh, presence in the US, our home market. Um, mm. Our headquarters these days is in Boston, uh, but we have people really all over the US and in Canada. Um, but but probably over half of our workforce is now outside of North America. Mm. Um, we also have people in very, very different roles. Um, a large proportion of our employees are in frontline operational roles. They're mm. people who drive uh, trucks to to take uh, records from our customers' uh, locations to our storage facilities and, and, and back. Uh, we have people who are taking care of those um, storage facilities as well. Uh, mm. And we also have a, a large uh, commercial team and, you know, people working in, in support functions too. So it's, it's a really, really diverse mix. And when you add to that, you know, cultural diversity, uh, all sorts of different backgrounds and experiences that our people have, the, what, the way we communicate to people, you know, need, needs to cut through in, in a very consistent way. Mm. Um, and one of the things that, that we recognized and, and found was that, a way to do that was to really make sure we have a, a very consistent tone of voice so that wherever you work in the world, mm. um, whatever role you have, you are hearing from the company and, and hearing people communicate to you in, in a pretty consistent way that, that really cuts through, you know, where you are, what you do um, and your background. So mm. we developed um, some tone of voice guidelines, which we, we are now embedding within the business that mm. really focus on three key things. Number one, you know, we are really people talking to people. So we should always remember that. We, we don't want our language to be too corporate or too stuffy mm. or too full of jargon. We want to be human. Um, we want to tell it how it is. We want to be straightforward in what we're saying, um, which sometimes means not making things too long, but it also means getting to the point and being transparent. Mm. Um, and we also want some personality. You know, people are from different backgrounds, different parts of the world. It's important that, you know, they own the communication or, or what the message is, but mm. they put their own stamp on it. And, you know, that's, that's important too. So those are the kind of guiding principles which I think mm. are helping us, you know, really, really make make our messages, make our communications just that little bit more human, a little bit more personal um, mm. and, you know, gets people a little closer to, uh, you know, to where they're hearing it. I like that, and and do those because they they you can almost position those as values, uh, you know, kind of communication values. Do they are they kind of correlating with the you know the underlying values of the company that down to earthness, the sort of say it the way it is, use plain language without dressing it up? Is that kind of linked in with the kind of culture of the organisation as well? 
Yes, it is. So, so mm. we, we have, um, you know, some core values where there is a connection, particularly mm. around taking ownership, particularly around inclusion and teamwork. Though those are two of our values. Mm. Um, but we also talk a lot about integrity. Um, mm. you know, so, again, making sure that a message is transparent is important. Mm. We talk about adding value to our customers. So, you know, when we're communicating internally, uh, we need to remember our audience uh, and yeah. that they need to get something out of what we're saying to them or what we want them to do. Um, and our, our sort of probably our prime uh, core value is safety and security. Now, mm. you know, you may not see an obvious connection through tone of voice, but again, if, if it's not easy to understand, if it's not, um, you know, straightforward to read, there's there's room for misinterpretation and, mm. and you don't often know what the consequence of that might be. Yeah. So, so, yes, I think increasingly in our communications, we're looking to connect as much as we can to our values mm. because they're important to us as a business. Our people respect them. Uh, and more and more our people are living them and that's what we mm. want to amplify a lot of the time mm. Mm. excellent and um, you mentioned there and well, you mentioned when you, you were just talking there about the business that you do have um you, you've got a kind of mix of of many organizations and i guess it's no surprise with some with an organization like yours that has physical facilities you've got a mix of people who are what we might call frontline, you know, kind of operational, and we've got office and administrative uh, uh, people as well. And obviously, I think during the, you know, during the pandemic, that that's been uh, a challenge for organisations who've got that, you know, people who've had to carry on staying at the office or staying at the front line and, and, and the facility because that's that's kind of where their work is. Whereas, obviously, people like ourselves have, have been able to to work from home. How have you been able to manage that that the challenges that I think that some internal communication I've been speaking to of, of pre- that's presented for them where there's a potential kind of two tier different uh, you know and, and also I think that a danger of, of of each group thinking that they've got it slightly more difficult than the other you know we've had to stay in the office or you know we've had to kind of work from home with kids and dogs and all this sort of thing how, how you manage that in such a diverse large organization so I think it comes back to, to one of the values I mentioned, you know, which is mm. about safety and security. That, that you know, throughout this pandemic has been top of mind for all of us and, you know, top of the list of the things we have communicated to people. Mm. And, and that really, you know, has been the same whether you have, you know, stayed in your workplace because you're in an operational role serving customers at the time where they've needed us the most yeah. or whether you've had to move you know pretty quickly to a virtual way of working that you may not have been used to um, so we've, we've spent a lot of time making sure people understand you know what guidelines to follow um, mm. wherever they work and whatever they do um, understand how to stay safe in doing that um, and also you know how to stay connected um, and, and how to, you know, continue working as, as much as possible, um, mm. you know, and, and serving customers, whether they're internal or external. So, you know, a lot of the things that we've, uh, I think, tried to do is, you know, make sure that communications are as frequent, if not more frequent than they were before the pandemic. Mm. Um, we have, you know, leaders who travel frequently around the world, visiting customers, visiting our employees. Um, you know, with them not being able to do that, it was a case of ramping up their virtual visibility, yeah. know, doing a lot more online, uh, hosting online Q&As, making sure that there was, you know, a constant connection uh, with leaders, you know, in many ways to give them reassurance that, you know, we have a stable business, we, we're resilient, but, you know, here are the steps we are taking to make you, our people and our customers safe, you know, whilst we continue to do business. Mm, mm, um, mm. So, you know, that as a, was a very clear message. Um, helping people understand that we were continuing to be by our customer's side uh, was important. You know, we have many customers who relied on us in those early days of the pandemic, whether it was here in the UK, you know, helping the National Health Service store PPE equipment um, mm. and create space at hospitals for, for extra beds. Um, in the US, we have customers who needed to process uh, welfare and unemployment benefits much more quickly as, as mm-hmm. people were being furloughed in different states. Um, so, so we really played a vital role in, in helping those businesses continue their own operations um, mm. and, and to do their bit, you know, to, to address and face the, the pandemic. And it was our frontline teams who were doing that. So, you know, we, we really put focus on our frontline teams, um, you know, not only in, in making sure they understood, you know, what they needed to do, where they needed to be, how things maybe were being done differently 
in that time where, where there was so much change, mm. but also recognizing the, just the amazing effort, you know, that that took mm. um, and celebrating mm. that. And I think that was a real unifying experience for the company yeah. last year. It, it really brought people together, whether they worked remotely, uh, whether they worked in an, on, an operational role and still seeing their colleagues every day. You yeah. know, it did create, I think, a, a much stronger bond. Mm. Um, mm. And, and, you know, that's something we want to build on. Um, hopefully, as we as we move out of the pandemic, you know, that's something I, I'd really like to see is retain and make sure that, you know, yeah. we are still thinking of different ways we can communicate to, um, you know, frontline teams with, with less easy access to technology. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, make sure they feel that they belong uh, as much as people who do, you know, have easy access to, to technology to stay connected. Okay. Yeah. I'd, I'd like to come back to that in a minute. Cause I think that's an area that I think a lot of, um, it's always interesting. It always interests me, interests me anyway. And I think interests our listeners as well is, is this, is, is, is that, you know, how do we communicate with, with people who don't necessarily have access to technology, which is becoming obviously any more increasingly, uh, important way of communicating with well I'll come back to that but I just, just I'm just interested and I, I, I've been asking a lot of my guests recently obviously this is quite contemporary but but in terms of um, you know how you see the future panning out for people who can work from home you know where where it is it is complementary to the uh, to their their, their their job role or, or their the way the way of working or, or even if it, where they where they'd prefer it themselves so it, it, what, it, what and I know different lots of different organizations are looking at this in different ways uh, how, what are you, what is are the plans at the moment in your business is it is it going to be hybrid is it going to be getting as many people back into the office as you can um what what what's the sort of current thinking there from from an iron mountain perspective well, I think we're looking at it with two key principles in mind, which are flexibility and choice, and, mm. and really, again, putting the employee at, at the heart of the decisions we make. So as right. an organization, we have said there is no expectation on any of our people that they need to return to the office if that's where they worked before uh, before the end of this year, before the end of 2021. Um, right. You know, if there are exceptions to that, they'll, they'll work with their manager to, to work that through. Um, but that's going to give us some time to really, you know, step back and think about what we need the workplace of the future to be for our organization yeah. how, how does that enable us to serve our customers better you know to put their needs first and then also to think about our own employees and, and you know the experience that they have of working with us you know which if it's good should make a positive impact on you know the customer experience that we want to deliver yeah. so i think you know come early next year we'll have an idea of what that will look like um Already, you know, some of our senior leaders are talking about the workplace being where you connect, where you collaborate and where you learn. You know, it's less about going somewhere to do work. I think the last 18 months or so have shown that we can do work from anywhere. Um, And maybe, you know, the office of the future is is where you come together really to make those connections, to to Mm -hmm. learn. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and to collaborate, you know, and, and to be more productive when you need to get that that sort of thing done, rather than mm. spend an hour or two on a train or a, a bus each way to work, and you know, only that then sit at a desk mm. to do what you could have done at home. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a really good acid test of, 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 you know, do I need to be there? Is there a connective element? Is there a collaborative element to it? Or is it stuff I can do at home? And I guess, I guess that's challenging in that, uh, the, the, I, I guess most of our working days, you know, it's not that you can dedicate a whole morning to usually anyway in the old way. Well, you know, if you were in the office and you'd pop into a meeting for an hour and then you'd go back to your desk and do some solitary work perhaps. So I guess it just, it requires more of a, um, uh, maybe a different way of thinking about how we structure our working day, doesn't it? If that's what we're going to do, if we're going to go into the office and do all our collaborative stuff that day or that morning, um, it, it's maybe just thinking a little bit more kind of thinking ahead and planning out our work rather than being maybe more fragmented, which I guess has been, a, you know, the way a lot of people work in the past when, you know, you've been in the office or even so, I think even so with um, during the pandemic, I, I think I've spoken to a lot of people who've said my days seem to be just sort of sp- very more, much more fragmented between, you know, kind of Zoom calls and then doing a bit of kind of personal stuff and, and then, you know, something that needs my kind of focus. I think it, it is going to be an interesting to see how organizations adapt and what sort of capabilities that, that, that raises within them. Yeah, um, it's that flexibility point, isn't it? And I, and mm. I think, you know, companies are going to have to think about the environment that they need to, to foster that as well. Mm. Um, you know, is, mm. is the, uh, office actually set up in that way whether it's technology layout 
to enable all of that mm. and if it isn't what, what needs to be done to to, to make those changes so, yeah so yeah. I, I think that's going to be a big part of it too yeah uh, as well as you know the way individual working styles may have changed and may stay the way they are now mm. uh, and that's for something that you know we i think all need to recognize in ourselves and each other and other people the people we mm. work with mm. um you know it's not going to be a return to how things were by any means no um and that's that could that could be progress um that, mm. could, that could actually help a lot of people in, in the way they work definitely so I just want to come back to the, the the thing we were talking about earlier, which is which is you, 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 I think you, I mean, what what is the split of if you have that in 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 your head, the split between what you would maybe call offline and online, you know, the kind of frontline people versus the um, the kind of administrative people. What, what what sort of percentage split do you have in Iron Mountain approximately? Would you say? I think our frontline teams account for about sixty five seventy percent of right. Our okay, people. okay, it's a really big proportion. Mm-hmm. And and so so uh, that, thanks so so I mean what 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 are some of the ways you because I've I've worked in and I guess your your guys uh, your people are you know, again it's we're, we're categorizing them we're, we're sort of stereotyping them as being offline I mean I guess a lot of those people are working in places where they do have access to technology but you mentioned you've got drivers you've got you've got uh, you know the people who maybe it's just not typically part of their working day um, so offline I'm talking about you know don't don't necessarily use email that much don't use sort of some of the the technology that, that we've now become familiar with what are some of the ways that you found are the most effective in terms of keeping them engaged and keeping them informed and and really communicating with them effectively yes well you're right um you know a lot of people have in theory access to um some of the you know digital channels that you and i in, in an office environment might might do but in practice you know their ability to access those regularly and to you know make them part of their their working day is is, is different so what we and i found to be you know the, the more effective ways of, of doing things i think there's a few ways that i, I think are important mm. i think first and foremost equipping the line manager is mm. really key um that is the person that you know most of our frontline teams will look to for information they'll ask questions um you know that's where they go with concerns so those people really need a good understanding of you know where where the business is heading and and Mm. how they and their teams fit in um because that i think is going to be more often than not the 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 main source of information uh for our frontline teams and get it right with the, the line manager and, and you're on to, a, I think, a, a winning formula. We haven't, you know, got it right, um, you know, by, by any means yet. There is still an awful lot we need to do. But, uh, you know, that that is certainly a focus for us, yeah. you know, how you not just, um, you know, share information with the line managers, but make sure that they feel confident to communicate and, and can do that effectively with their teams as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so developing managers in that way, you know, is, is certainly something we want to do more of um, and, you know, think about what we need to do in terms of the information they receive that, that mm-hmm. will benefit the teams that they talk to. So that's one area. I, I think, you know, digital channels is, is still something you can do a lot with. Um, mm. with with frontline teams particularly you know where most people you know now have a mobile device whether it's a company mobile or a personal mobile mm. so i do think there are still ways that you can reach frontline teams directly through digital channels you have to just be choiceful about how you do that what you share and 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 how you use it and and don't expect that to become the primary way of communicating with them it's going to be again their choice really um, about you know how they use that and i think our job as communicators is to make that experience and the content they receive through it as compelling and as relevant Mm. as we can Mm. Uh, and then you know they're more likely to to use it and and to absorb it so i think that's Mm. something that's that remains important Mm. and i also think you know you've got to make use of what's already there Um, Mm. so in our business, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, scanners, handheld scanners that, that our frontline teams use to scan okay. a barcode on a box before they load it onto a truck um, and, and deliver that box to a customer. That scanner has the capability to carry video and messages. Uh, okay, um, so, yeah. again, we you know can use that as a channel, uh, mm. knowing that at some stage in the day, that scanner will be in the hands of a frontline employee. Um, yeah. So, again, it's being about, 
choiceful about what you use it for and how you use it, recognizing that they don't have much time in the day. Um, the prime focus on them is, is getting the job done in the time they need to. Um, yeah. That's an avenue, as are you know more traditional means of communicating like bulletin boards, yeah. digital signage screens where it's available. So again, thinking about what's already there and what you can make use of, I think, is really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then across all of that, I've, I've mentioned, I think, just how important, meaningful and relevant content is. Um, you know, this is about just making sure that the employee sees themselves in what you're saying to them. Um, mm. and sees where they fit in, how they contribute. And also, you know, back to that tone of voice, talking to them in a way that makes sense to them. That could be directly in their own language, but also, you know, in the style that they're used to hearing uh, and, and receiving information mm. as well. Mm. And so you've mm. really got to know your audience and understand their working day, how much time are they realistically going to have to to take a look at what you'd like them to. Um, mm. And then develop your plan around that, and I think mm. that that combination, you know, will often give you a better outcome. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I and and I, I think oh yeah, I, I, just, I really like the idea of using, you know, the technology that they're using to to use as a communication device, the scanner idea. I think is really really good. But I also, you know, going back to what you were saying right at the beginning, which is, um, I mean, recorded an episode about this a while ago um, in in the first series of the podcast with Chris Coburn, we were talking about, you know, the, that was all about the line manager, you know, the importance of the line manager. Because I think, as you said, I think it's often often overlooked, particularly in for frontline teams, is is that critical role. That, 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 and again, it's not just about, you know, using them as a kind of a, a megaphone. It's actually giving them the capability to really engage and understand all of these sort of subtle nuances and, and making it you know, a really, a really core capability for, for frontline managers, particularly for those who are managing people who don't have access or necessarily have the access or exposure to some of the communication channels that um, other people may have. So I totally agree with you on that. I think it's a really, it's really good to hear you say that. Um, um, and just, just sort of, just to sort of wrap things up in terms of, you know, again, sort of, putting it back into maybe a context of the pandemic, but then looking forward into the next sort of two, three years or so. I mean, what are some of the things that you see are going to be pivotal for uh, for, for internal communicators in terms of the types of skills and behaviours that they need to be either looking to develop or reassessing or, or, or maybe reevaluating their own kind of competencies uh, going forward? Because I think we've, we've all agree we've seen a fairly seismic shift in terms of how people are going to be working. We've talked a little bit about that, but also not even people who are <clears throat> not necessarily going to be kind of hybrid working are going to be working from home. I think there's still a, sh- a shift in what we look at, you know, the way we perceive the world, perspectives have changed, all sorts of things. So what are some of the things that you you see as being kind of relevant in terms of capabilities for, for, for internal communicators going forward? Well, first and foremost, I, I think we've got to be closer than ever to the needs of the business um, and, and really get under the skin of what the business is all about, how it mm. operates, how it may need to change in terms of those operations in the future. Um, and really understand what's on the minds of the leaders that we support. Um, yeah. You know, getting to sort of really understand what's keeping them awake at night, what what their big challenges are. Um, you know, how they're seeing the future. I think you know that is top of our list. Um, mm. I, I think a lot of the the other skills that that we have and that we need are, are, are essential um, and potentially a bit more foundational. Um, mm. But but really demonstrating our business acumen, I think, is going to continue to mm. be really important. Mm. Um, I think connected to that, you know, if we are going to be working in a more virtual way in the future, um, we need to understand how to make connections and build relationships uh, in a more virtual environment. Um, you know, a lot of us have, have sort of grown up by being able to just, you know, pop your head around somebody's door or, <laughs> or grab a coffee with them. Uh, and that may not be as easy uh, mm. anymore. Uh, to just get those impromptu moments where where you can just you know get to understand a person a bit more what they're working on, um, so I think we've got to find ways to do that you know virtually um, mm. and make the most of the times where we are together in person uh, to do that as well, mm. um, and then a couple of other areas I think storytelling is is something that you know we need to build on. I think it's mm. increasingly going to be important as you know an emotional way of connecting to to our people. Um, mm. I think, you know, the, the way communications have evolved through this pandemic, there is more of a focus on on 
you know, emotion. And, you know, it's not been a rational 18 months by any no. means. And I think we, we've got to recognize mm. that and, and, you know, embrace how we communicate and, mm. you know, bring to life what it is we want our people to know or do uh, mm. in a different way that actually, again, helps them connect, helps them feel like they belong. And I think, you know, storytelling is a very powerful way of doing that. So, so mm. that's a skill I think we need to continue to build on. Mm. And then mm. the last thing I'd say, I think it's actually about data. Um, mm. I think data is something, um, you know, is, is available to us all as communicators, but we probably don't make enough of to really understand either our business, our audiences, uh, how people are feeling, you know, that there are so many different ways I think we can make use of, of just the sheer amount of data that's out there now. Mm. So again, tapping into the areas of the business that we may not have traditionally made connections with that, that own those data sources, I think it's going to be really important. And, and then mm. how we use that and how we can demonstrate, you know, that we're making decisions and plans based on that, I think it's going to be really important going into mm. the future as well. Mm. No, I think that's, that's a really good, uh, a really good summary and, and a good, a good, a good set of the principles to, to, to think about, you know, if anyone's listening to this, I mean, who's, who is looking to their sort of skill set going forward. I think that's a really good, uh, a good summary. Um, that's been really, really interesting, Neil. I, and I love the story of, of Iron Mountain and how, how the business started and the kind of journey that, that the business has been on. Fantastically diverse organization. I, I'm really interested and, uh, you know, loved listening to this sort of what you were saying there around um, how you've kind of made sense of, 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 of the pandemic and you, you, and also how you see the world, the, the world panning out after the pandemic. And also, you know, really interesting to sort of hear you talk about, about how, how um, you've successfully engaged your, your, you're successfully engaging your offline employees as well with, with some of the, the, the kind of th thinking around that. Just, just finally, just, just in terms of, you know, kind of summing up and wrap, wrapping up and any, any kind of last sort of, um, career because you've got a, a fantastic career you've had a fantastic career you're still having a fantastic career any any kind of golden nuggets that you you want to kind of share with the audience before we kind of uh, conclude the, uh, the, the the conversation and i've got the other question that i was going to ask you just to wrap up as well well for me the, the reason i've stayed in internal communications as long as i have is mm -hmm. it's all about the people I think, yeah. um, you know, the, the reason I enjoy what I do is, is helping people feel connected to the organizations they work for uh, and work with. And, mm. you know, the more we as, as communicators can make that, you know, engaging, enlightening, interesting, fun, um, you know, we're doing our jobs and, and increasingly, yeah. you know, organizations are seeing the value of that and seeing the difference it makes to their in, in their own reputations and i think yeah. that's where you know building trust from the inside out really comes from for me if you get it right with your own workforce uh you know they are going to talk positively about your organization and that's going to spread um you know further and further than, than you might be able to ach achieve otherwise so that's yeah. why i do it that's why i continue to do it and, <laughs> and it's uh, it's keeping me busy and, and it's still a whole lot of fun yeah Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Well, thank you, Neil. Now, what, the final question, as I know I've warned you, and I told pre-warned you before the interview, is that I always ask my interviewees this, is, um, uh, yeah, something that even people who work with you will know you quite well, uh, maybe don't know about you. It's either something you've done in the past or something you do now. And I don't, I always know, I never know what these, uh, these, uh, the, these sort of surprises are. So I'm always equally sort of surprised by them. So uh, uh, over to you, Neil. What what is your uh, something we don't uh, we don't know or people generally don't know about Neil Jenkins? So I am a big Liverpool fan, which isn't a surprise to a lot of people that, that know me. Um, <laughs> but I'll tell you a story about uh, a match I went to in 2005, probably the greatest match in Liverpool's history. I was lucky enough to be in Istanbul. Uh, to see them win the Champions League final against mm -hmm. AC Milan that year. Mm -hmm. An absolutely incredible match, a, a night I'll never forget. Um, but it started with a chance meeting with a true football legend. Um, and, and what happened was um, I was sort of walking around the corner of the outside of the stadium. I just arrived with my friends and saw a bit of a commotion. Uh, people crowded around a figure or sort of who was stood above them on a, on a walkway. So I looked over and I thought, I wonder what's going on there. So so wandered over, um, and it was Diego Maradona. Oh, Diego wow. Maradona was was stood on this walkway, um, mm. surrounded by sort of fans trying to either take a picture or 
or, or sort of, um, you know, say hello. So I kind of muscle my way in. And if people have sort of seen me in person, I'm, I'm pretty tall. I'm six foot three. Mm. So I managed to kind of get my hand sort of within range and ended up high-fiving Diego Maradona before the game. Um, and I think it was the hand of God. It was the hand, was it? I was <laughs> going to ask that. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. So, so that is something that, um, you know, started what was a, a very, very special uh, night for, for me yeah. and, and, you know, for every Liverpool fan who was there. Um, but, um, yes, added a touch of surrealism to the, the whole day. Yeah. Yeah, no, I can remember. I remember I was in, a, I, I, it's like, you know, where were you when sort of moment. I can remember I was in a hotel in in Richmond in London uh, on business and I remember watching the game. And it, 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 for listeners who probably may not know of it, I think it what, you were 3-0 down at half time, brought it back to 3-3, three, three, was it? And and then won in, on penalties, was it? Is that how, it, how the game That's transpired? That's right. Yeah, and yeah. Um, those three goals that Liverpool scored in the second half were within the space of six minutes. So yes, that's right. Link, yeah, Lincoln, yeah. you would have missed it, but yes, yeah, it was an incredible game it, it against was. a fantastic AC Milan team. And yeah, uh, yeah. luckily for Liverpool, we came out on top that night. Yeah, yeah I remember it. I remember, I remember it. Uh, it was one of those uh, sort of fairy tale games, wasn't it? <laughs> Excellent. Well, look, that's been absolutely fantastic, Neil. Thank you very much. Um, as I said to you when I we had the pre-conversation, I've been kind of following your stuff on LinkedIn for a while and, and I'd, I'd kind of you know, finally kind of got, got around to saying, you know, hey, Neil, I'd love to, love to talk to you. And, and and the podcast is a way I kind of like to sort of, uh, you know, kind of find out more about people. So it's been really good speaking to you. Um, I, I, I normally in the show notes, which uh, just for explanation for people who are listening, the show notes are on our website. So we, if you if you listen to this on iTunes, you'll find it on our actual website. We list the show notes, which is just a kind of uh, a, a kind of a narrative of the a written narrative of the interview, not just a transcript but actually a kind of more, more kind of descriptive uh, uh, sort of article. So you'll find them in there. But I'll put a link to your LinkedIn profile, Neil, if that's all right, if anyone would like to um, find you on LinkedIn. And obviously, if, if they want to connect with you, I mean, it's up to you whether you want to accept that or not, but uh, if that's okay. Yes, please do. More than welcome. And you and you, I, you, I know you. I, I, I know you're on Twitter, but I know that's your sort of personal Twitter account. So um, I won't put that in the in the show notes unless you want us to. But uh, I think LinkedIn is usually the way that people prefer to uh, to stay in touch uh, professionally. So, um, but uh, if any other Liverpool supporters want to connect with you, I'm sure they'll find, be able to find you on Twitter anyway. So. Uh, um, but anyway, well, thank you very much, Neil. Um, wish you all the best for the rest of the summer, and obviously uh, beyond that, as we go into this uh, this new brave new world that we're we're all looking looking into. And um, yeah, we'll stay safe and and uh, and 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 as I said, have a have a great rest of the the year, and uh, look forward to catching you with you at some other point in the future. Thanks a lot, Craig. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Neil. So, thank you for listening to Engaging Internal Comms. Hope you found this episode useful. Um, we'd love to get your feedback and thoughts about the show. So, and, and also any questions or ideas that you've got for things you'd like us to cover in future episodes. So, you can email us at info at thebigpicturepeople.co.uk or you can get in touch with us via the contact form on our website, which is engagingic.com. Also, you'll be able to sign up for our mailing list there and we'll send you relevant news about the show, new episodes, and also anything that we think you might be interested in when it comes to internal communications or employee engagement. If you like the show and you haven't already done so, please subscribe to it via your podcast service. And also you can subscribe to it via the links on our podcast page, which again is engagingic.com. Um, if you know anyone else who might be interested in the show please distribute it to them please let them know about it we want to try and grow a community of people here who are contributing to the show giving us new ideas for episodes and things that you'd like to cover in future so thank you very much